that significance, sharing, giving back, right? Like big names like Tony Robbins talks about like the secret to living is giving. So just giving back in any way that you can, not giving your house away and becoming a bum, but sharing. If you can't share 10% 10% of 100,000, are you going to be able to share 10% of 10 million? So start right. sharing, yeah. giving back, <laughs> and that provides a ton of significance, which leads to purpose. And you can put that into action every single day. And holy smokes, there's some, to use a fighter pilot term, there's your afterburner uh, results that you need. Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, Night Shift Emergency Physician, Burnout Thriver, and Wellness Champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously hey thanks for checking out this episode be sure to click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when the next video comes out it only takes two seconds to make two clicks so let's do it let's get back to the video Hello, 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 Fearless Freedom Tribe. This is Dr. G, and we are back for another exciting episode where you get to face your fear, hear all the nuggets about how you can do that. And this is the Fearless Freedom with Dr. G podcast. Today, we have on the show with us, Dominic Tyke. So Dominic, you have got to tell us all about yourself and what you are up to, because I know you're up to a lot. Yeah. So, uh, the newest thing is, uh, connecting with, uh, fighter pilots to get their, their stories into, um, a series of books we call single seat wisdom. And it's given me a lot of purpose. I have, I've owned a couple of businesses. Um, I've been a civilian and military fighter pilot. Um, the, these ones, uh, these books, single seat wisdom, the, the second volume we're getting ready to publish right now, is just, as you can tell in my voice, it's just given me a lot of purpose in life. It's an incredible amount of work uh, approaching 20 fighter pilots uh, and asking them to share their story and share their short story and contribute uh, monetarily to a children's cancer nonprofit. Um, but holy smokes, it's it's something that's given me a lot of purpose. I, I that that's all I can say about that. The uh, apartment investing um, company that I own, I actually have gone away from wanting to be a very institutional firm and more niche. And we essentially help um, place capital for fighter pilots and pilots in apartment real estate. So I've kind of dialed that business in um, and single seat mindset. That new company is just, it's given me uh, so much, uh, so much back to me, right? Because you can't be purely altruistic. Um, I am definitely out of my, if you want to talk about, uh, fear, I'm definitely way out of my comfort zone. Uh, cause fighter pilots, uh, historically do not write books. They don't build websites. They don't, uh, start podcasts. I mean, there are some that do that, but it's a fairly rare thing. So when people find out that we're publishing books and doing all this, it is, uh, it's just such a different conversation, but it is, it's so, it's so fun. And it's, and it just is, is we're giving back. Right. And I think that's uh, the biggest piece to it. Awesome. So I sense that there's quite a bit to uncover there from what you said. So let's start with, let's start with you. And so you alluded to the fact that you have a connection to being a fighter pilot or you are a fighter pilot or you were a fighter pilot. Tell us about that journey. How did that come about? Yeah. So, um, at a young age at seven years old, I built a little fighter jet model with my dad on the kitchen table. And there were some pretty impactful things as I recall in my childhood leading up to that. But I mean, at, at 12 years old, I was standing on the flight deck with my uncle, uh, who was a Alaskan um, Airlines mechanic, and they were doing engine runs. So I got to stand on the flight deck as a little kid and just kind of watch, uh, you know. And as I as I say that out loud, nowadays that would be unheard of to let kids in in a big airliner as they're doing engine runs, just from a liability yeah, yeah, standpoint. Yeah, but sure. <laughs> I got to do that, and then at 16, 
I thought that I was going to be like my uncle. I was just going to go wrench on airplanes. I'd meet pilots and learn how to fly. But I was handed a flyer to the, um, no pun intended, to the uh, flight school, the local flight school. And I started, instead of wrenching on airplanes, I started flying airplanes at 16. And at nice. 18, I was a civilian flight instructor. I had worked um, pretty hard for two or three or four years, um, building time and set myself up to get hired by an airline. But at the same time, I got picked up to be a, uh, a pilot in the Air Force. And okay. I opted to take that route being, um, you know, that was kind of a one and done thing. You, you take it and you can go. If you turn it down, then you don't know if you get that opportunity again. Uh, um, and then in the Air Force, just, you know, competed and, and did my best and worked my way into the uh, fighter track and into the, I'm now, a, I'm actually still, I'm a full-time reservist. And really all that means is I'm no different than all of the active duty military. I'm just, I'm stationed in one place and I'm a okay. full-time uh, fighter pilot instructor. So I get to teach in the schoolhouse here, um, the students that um, potentially have never touched a fighter jet before all the way up through very senior officers that have many years flying that need to be requalified after they've done uh maybe a tour out of out of the fighter uh jet world wow okay so that is a pretty incredible path so you know i don't i don't think your uncle realized uh the indelible imprint he was gonna make yeah. on your life and the pathway so that's really cool. And so, I mean, is, is your uncle still around? He actually still works for Alaskan Airlines as a mechanic and he runs all of their quality control processes. So he gets to um, he gets to travel the world and 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 do that. And still, he, I mean, he's been doing it for 35 years, I think. Wow. Um, so he that is definitely a passionate thing for him. And I actually had lunch with him, I don't know, maybe about a month ago. And that was my one of my biggest things that I, I let him know. I said, you just never know when you're going to be able to uh, positively influence somebody in their life, right? And, and yes. the things that you think, right? And here's the other thing um, that I've learned is the people that actually let you know that you are an influence in their life are so few. Yes. I, I mean, I think, granted, I haven't read any studies and maybe maybe you would know, but I would imagine that maybe it's less than 1%. So if you're a person that's providing an influence through, you know, a podcast like yours, I can imagine that, you know, if, if you're getting feedback, you could probably times that by a hundred at least, and just know that you're, you're doing some good in the world. That is good to know <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, when you're doing, when you're doing something that you enjoy, oftentimes you don't even think about that. Right. And it yeah. sounds like your uncle truly enjoyed his work so much so that he, you know, he brought you in and he was showing you, the ropes. I don't know if, if his intention was for you to follow in his footsteps. I don't know. Or maybe he just wanted to expose you. I, it's just it's just really neat to hear how, you know, how that all got started. And then yeah. to to see that you um, then you took to actually flying, which, you know, is pretty cool, too. Yeah. yeah. It's great. And, so, and then so you um, so you and then and then then I really love that you um you went from the student to the, um, you know, to get mastery and then to becoming the teacher, which is phenomenal because then you're even, you're making even a greater impact, right? So you have to tell us, was there any fear involved in any of this? Like, was there fear when you decided to opt for um, the um, Air Force versus uh, commercial flights? Like, was there fear involved there or did you have any, any place along the road here where you felt fear and how did you deal with it? Yeah, I think, um, generally speaking and, and maybe this is just, I, so I grew up out in the country riding dirt bikes and downhill skiing and shooting guns and lighting fires. And, and so, and we got hurt. So I don't know how we didn't die growing up, honestly. I mean, we had, <laughs> I questioned we that had, too myself. <laughs> <laughs> we we had tree forts that were 60 feet up and pine trees that had an intricate cable system that went through the different trees on our property and and there was no safety you just you hung there and you just zipped lined to the next tree you weren't a helmet or anything like that Nothing. <laughs> and you know how we set this up we didn't ask our parents we just we uh, i i think it was my dad's i hope we didn't steal it but we got we acquired wire and we 
<laughs> we didn't have any bad. I mean, we were, we were kids, we were 12, 13 years old. And the way that we tested our, our, our zip lines was trial and error. So, oh my gosh, if it, so if it was, was the one that who got to try it? I was the, the second oldest. So generally speaking, <laughs> I was either the kid that got stranded halfway on the wire or I oh slammed into the tree, uh, down below. Oh my um, God. <laughs> so wow. fear, I, I, I don't, I am wired, a, I think a little bit differently is that I don't view fear as something that um, necessarily stops me. I'm more of someone, especially in business, um, when, when, I, when I found that I was getting goosebumps or really out of my comfort zone, um, I tend to grab onto that and go, I don't know what's going to happen, but you know, it's like grabbing the bull by the horns. Let's go for the ride and see, and see what happens. Um, I'm a, and the other thing to that is I, because I'm not, um, fearful that can make me look stupid because, you know, I'm going to go hit that jump as fast and as hard as I can. And I'm just going to see what happens, right? Because I'm an action taker. Gotcha. So knowing that the, the lesson behind that is, um, I, I think it was, I think it's scribed into a Greek temple potentially, but it says it's it, in Greek, it's know thyself. And I think that's my, my lesson to myself is there are things that along my journey, knowing that maybe I'm not fearful, I need to have somebody in, in my team or in my, uh, you know, my close circle that goes, Hey, can you sanity check this for me? Am, oh, I, about nice. to, <laughs> am I about to just send it off of a cliff or, Hey, can you go test the snow low of this jump to make sure I'm not sending my pink body into an avalanche? So I think that was kind of the thing that I learned growing up is, um, we, my uncles were incredibly tough. Um, I got frostbite on my toes when I was skiing growing up and you just kept skiing. It just, that's, oh my gosh. it just, when it you, was, when you go home and put in some warm water, yeah, <laughs> like, you'll be yeah. all right. <laughs> it took about three years for me to get feeling back in my big toe on my right foot. So, I mean, we oh, just, my we grew up in a, in a, um, not as tough as, you know, the 1950s and sixties, if I was going to compare, right. Or God forbid the, uh, the great depression, but you know, we just, we just grew up in the country and it was kind of, we split wood and, and did all that stuff. And to get to your, to, to get to your point, the, the fear, I would say, I don't, I don't typically run from fear. Um, but at times it is completely okay, at least in my historical perspective to be fearful of things, but to know that the level higher than that, to know, you know, as I joined the air force and I went off for the first time, moved away from my family and drove in a friend's car that I had met two days prior all the way across the country to check into officer training school to get screamed at for 14 weeks. Um, that was a shell shock. And I would say that there were times where I was very fearful that, you know, maybe um, I wasn't going to make it. But as I stood there and I told myself those um, negative things as they were coming to my mind, I would just look left and right and be like, everybody else is here doing this. And there was a couple of other trainees there as well, that as I was going through that and I was fearful and I was thinking, man, am I going to make this? Am I going to, am I going to flunk this next academic test? Am I, I going to fail the run or the rock march or the, whatever it was. And I would just look around and be like, you know, we are, we're here in this together and, and just keep pressing through one more day at a time. Wow. That is, that is something else. And then, so, you know, then, then, okay. So you, that's, that's, that's amazing. Like you for the first time, leave your family, right? Like you, it sounds like you guys are very close because of the fact that, you know, you've been through all these, these little mini adventures together, particularly with siblings. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're in a place that's not highly populated, right? So you have each other and you probably spend a whole lot of time with each other. And now you're like, you're separating from the family for the first time. And you're getting into this car with somebody who you barely know to drive yeah. a large distance across the country to get to this camp. And then you get there and then you're like, wait a second, like what's happening? And then you're having to like draw on all of those lessons that you learned from like, you know, trying out the wires that are attached to trees that maybe not <laughs> have the right tensile strength to hold your body up. And, you know, being the tester to see who is going to fall first and all of that. And you're you 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 seem like 
even when you had your doubts, like you had those tools from your childhood to draw on, which is incredible. And then, you know, you're, you're in something which, I mean, I don't know if you thought about this at the time, but you're in the armed forces. Okay. So that means that at any point you could potentially be deployed somewhere to some kind of fighting. Yep. And because hence the name fighter pilots, right? Yeah. So did you ever like think about that? Like, was that even was that even like a thought when you were yeah. when you were so starting? I, I this think adventure? the difference is is because I haven't actually um you, you just kind of keyed me into something and and because I, I normally get the question when you're taking off on a combat sortie, are you fearful or are you scared? And my answer is absolutely not. Um one because American fighter pilots, not necessarily myself, but they're, we are the best in the world. America has the best fighter pilot. Pe people around the world that are our partners train with American fighter pilots. All right. I am a competent fighter pilot, but if it comes to the top tier fighter pilot in the Air Force, I don't come close. So I am very humbled to be part of this group um, because I have never been the best. Uh, you know, it, I, I was not selected to go to Top Gun school. I'm not a Top Gun instructor. Um, I am a, a fighter pilot instructor, which there are some very difficult and challenging things to do in order to become that. Um, but why that is, it's so fun is it keeps me on my toes, right? Because I, I know that there's always going to be someone better than me. Um, there's going to be a student or a requalifying pilot that just kicks my butt one day or, you know, so it just keeps you on your toes. Um, but in regards to go stepping out the door with my combat gear on, to strap on a single seat fighter jet and take off. Fear is not something that goes through our mind because we train so much. And from a, the, the U S military and militaries around the world have gotten incredibly good at taking, unfortunately there's good and bad to it, right? Because they want you to, your, they want your, the plastic matter, your brain to just react to something. You see this stimulus, you make this reaction, right? They don't want you prefrontal cortex. They want you motor cortex. Yeah, they want you standing in the batter's box, you know, cause it's world series game three tonight. And they want you in the batter's <laughs> box and they want you to see the pitch and they want you to use your training and hit the ball, but they can't have you thinking about it. So I say that because in regards to training, Anybody can train, whether it's in business, being a doctor, you know, I can imagine what would just completely terrify me is cutting somebody open and seeing their guts in front of me. That would just yeah. absolutely terrify me. However, I can imagine that after practice, your brain gets used to that, right? And you, you then are trained and there's processes and checklists just like pilots. So whether you're an accountant, a doctor, a pilot, an athlete, um, Fighter pilots make decisions at 800 plus miles an hour. I would say that is the one thing that maybe we do a little, we're trained to do a little bit differently, but zero students are good at flying fighter jets when they first start the airplane and start taxiing and try to take off. But it is a learned experience and they are fearful at that point, but you can train yourself and through training, your brain gets used to it. Just like having, I mean, if I were to stand in a batter, now I played baseball all the way up through junior college college. But if I were to stand in the batter box and a guy like Randy Johnson or Nolan Ryan pitched a baseball past me, I'd be a little bit fearful, but after about 20 or 30 pitches, maybe that edge would come off a little bit, right? Maybe I'd foul a ball off. Um, now in regards to fearing deployments, that is the worst part of being in the military for me personally, is that feeling of knowing way out in advance that I'm going to leave and then also knowing that it's at least six months that I'll be gone, just physically gone in, you know, my first um, deployment, we got shelled 56 times on base. Um, my second deployment, we were in, you know, other bad parts of the world. And, and there was a lot of stuff that I learned from that, um, that led to a big mental crash, uh, after, but then as I picked myself back up the bootstraps, you know, I was fearful and that led to a lot of growth. And so I think the biggest lesson is those things that you fear the most, at least in my experience, if you're willing to just grab on and go in six months, can I look back and have grown from this? That six month viewpoint is more like a month usually for me. If I can just hold on, I tell myself six months and then 
that has its positives and negatives as well. But usually in six months, there is growth that has come out of that, that pain or that fear, um, at least in my experience. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. That is something that like, I love that you, you, you give yourself grace to like surface from that feeling because I mean, we all, we all feel it. Right. I mean, you're doing something new. You're like putting yourself out there. You feel that, but it's the fact that you give yourself grace to understand and understand that at the end of it, you're going to be a better person. Like literally, if it doesn't kill you, it will make you stronger. Like it's crazy. <laughs> so I love that. That is awesome. Hey, it's Dr. G and I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. I'm so honored to have you here with me. Did you know that I can help you to get your own podcast started? With my podcasting launch course for professionals, I walk you through everything you need to know about starting a podcast. I'm with you every step of the way from sign up to launching your show with five episodes ready to go. There's a done for you version that's also available. If you would just rather just do recordings and leave the behind the scenes work up to us, then that one is definitely for you. But either way, we've got your back here at Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Oh, if you already have a show and you need production services, we have monthly plans available for you. So check out the links in the episode show notes for more information. Let's get back to the show. And then, so, you know, and, and actually, I really appreciate your perspective on the, the deployment situation because I, um, I mean, here right now I'm living in Guam. And a lot of people around me are military, right? And yeah. I always ask them that question. I mean, first, I thank them greatly for their sacrifice because, you know, obviously, you know, if you don't sacrifice, um, you know, freedoms are not had, right? And, and and that is greatly appreciated. But I always kind of wonder, like, what, how do you feel about that? Like, you make a commitment to a mission, right? Which are, are to a, a, a section of the armed forces. But yeah. I mean, I just always wonder, like when you make that commitment, are you going into it thinking about the possibility of actually having to go to a war zone, you know? And so that I don't think of the people that I've talked to, a lot of them don't think about that. They think about the other benefits and there are a lot of benefits to being in the military. I mean, you, you learn a lot, right? I mean, you can develop yeah. skills. You can, um, you can build, you know, you can actually set yourself up for a nice life afterward, you know, but you know, it's, I just was, I'm always curious about that, you know, but it seems like oftentimes the decision is made without fear, without the fear of going to the war zone, the decision is made. And then I think that some people get to that point where they start to feel the fear only when they get their orders to go to the place yeah, in, my, in, I, what I, I, in what I've, in the people I've talked to, which I find fascinating. I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I going in, I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot and now granted, I didn't walk around day one in training and say, I'm going to be a fighter pilot. But in my mind, I said, I'm, I'm not going to leave any stone unturned. I'm not going to, I'm not going to rest on weekends until I get to the fighter track. And then when I get to the fighter track, I'm going to continue competing to make sure that I get a fighter jet uh, as my assignment. So I was very driven to, to go into that career field, just like um, I would imagine that if you were a, a doctor and you wanted to be a Green Beret or a Navy SEAL, you that's an incredibly difficult thing to do just alone, becoming a doctor, but then also going through the physical rigors of hanging out with some of the toughest dudes on the planet that literally like eat rocks for breakfast and then right. hold their breath for like five minutes and swim under the ocean to like go kill people. <laughs> right. So I can imagine that, you know, there's, there's some career fields specifically as a fighter pilot, 
I knew that I would have to deploy. I knew that, um, killing people is part of that profession. Unfortunately, I knew all of those things. However, how do you, how do you teach that to somebody that has not gone through that experience? How do you, how do you tell them about the gravity of it? You don't because everybody processes their own trauma differently, right? Just like I did, just like a lot of other people did my, my classic, uh, thing to do up until about six years ago was I didn't take the trash out. So I had my trash can, I had a really nice lid and a lock on it. And if something bad came up, I would throw it in the trash can. I'd slam the lid and I'd keep it in there. Well, one day I didn't take the trash out for so many years for my whole life. I'm a man. I'm going to take care of it myself. I got this. I'm tough. I'm type a, and then I threw a hand grenade in there and it blew up. And then now I found myself dealing with my mental state that I was in and, you know, your brain does some pretty crazy things to you, especially when you start reliving whether, whether or not, you know, you got in a car accident or you had a family member that abused you growing up or what have you that sticks with you. And you tend to build these personalities out in front of you. And unfortunately when they all get taken away, it's (laughs) you're naked. The emperor has no clothes. And that's what I faced. And it was extremely painful. But honestly, I think it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. Um, And it really led to, you know, my first business growing. I grew a second business, but decided to turn it off because it was all about money and there wasn't a whole lot of purpose behind it. And then this third business was a business to, um, we give all of the proceeds to this children's cancer nonprofit we write books and capture these stories from these old guys. We have an online presence that gets fighter pilots together to teach young people about how to be a peak performer in short, impactful steps. And none of that stuff would have happened if I didn't go through the pain of uh, getting a little bit wonky in my own mind and then going, well, this is weird. I probably need some counseling and I need to, you know, sharpen the saw, if you will, and, and I'll grow from this. I just don't know what that looks like. Um, and it takes time and I'm incredibly blessed to have a wife that just stood by me and didn't nag me and just knew that stuff was going on. And as I started to get a little bit better, we went to couples counseling, which was painful. And I was fearful of that every single time because I would learn about how bad I was doing, (laughs) but every day after that, it was always better. So I had to remind myself that I was fearful to go fearful to expose those things in my life. But I always reminded myself after the first time, the next day was so much better. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's incredible. Um, that is like, wow, because you basically, you, it sounds like you went through burnout, honestly. So you went, you went through that. And yeah. as a result of that, you emerged a completely different person and allowed you to dig deeper into your relationships. It allowed you to dig deeper into what your, what your mission or your purpose is sounds like yeah. as well, which yeah. is amazing. That is absolutely yeah. amazing. And just, and you talk to me about impact, <laughs> just think about the impact that you're having now because of the decision that you made to deal with yourself. You know, most people don't ever get there. I mean, you were, you were there, you, but you were there at a time when you were at a low point, which some people, when they get to that low point, they just don't get up out of it at least. And they also, if they do get out of it, they don't get out of it and are in a, um, external mode. Cause it sounds like yeah. you were in external mode at that point. Like you were yeah. like, look, I'm dealing with my stuff, but you realize that like your wife was definitely a huge role player in this, in this, in this play, right. In this program. Yeah. And you had to be better for her. Right. You had to like deepen the relationship that you had with her. That is incredible. And then, and then you said that your business did even better because you dealt with those issues that were tucked away, buried, compartmentalized for so many years. So I think that that 
is an incredible, incredible, you know, experience to share because I think people tend to feel like number one, we're afraid to say that we have hit a low point, right? That's our number one thing. We don't want to say it, particularly when you're type A, particularly when you're high achieving, like that is not something you want to talk about. And so you have, you are brave enough to talk about that. Number one. And then number two, you're brave enough to deal with you bring in those close to you. And then also as a result, you impacted a lot of people because everybody who was employed in your business, everybody who was affected by your business, everybody who is getting to read these books, everybody who is benefit benefiting from the childhood cancer um, foundation, all those people are being impacted because you chose to improve on you. That's incredible. That I wish I, I appreciate you saying that, uh, the big man upstairs, uh, God has given me a bunch of life experiences that we've repackaged. And the, the, the powerful piece of this is it's not me. Sure. I have some ideas and I'm kind of, I'm a, um, what would you call it? An inertia guy. I like to found things and start things and get things going. Um, because that's a mountain to climb when you're starting something new and you're doing something different. Um, nowhere on the internet can you find a book that has 20 fighter pilot stories and nowhere on the internet can you find a volume of books that every book has 20 fighter pilot stories. And I have not told anybody on this, on the podcasting in the podcasting world yet, but my goal is to have at least five so we can repackage all the stories and have a hundred fighter pilot stories in one place. Um, because I would have sat down as a little kid and just the intrigue, even if I didn't want to be a fighter pilot, I wanted to play baseball, um, you know, for many years, I would have just read those stories because they're short, they're crazy stories. These, these guys, some of these guys I know really well, and I read their stories and I'm like, dude, your wife died from cancer. And then you got remarried to another lady who her husband died from cancer. And, and then he provides his wisdom or his perspective at the end of his chapter. Right. So this stuff is crazy. And I think what you're hinting at this word purpose, or, you know, you, you, you hear about all this negative stuff right now, which is uh, quiet quitting and all of these um, things where people are leaving the workforce. And I think there is some goodness to that because people are starting to wake up and go, I don't want to be just an autonomous robot inside of a big bureaucracy that only focuses on corporate gains. I want to do something bigger in my life. Now, some people can find a ton of purpose in that, but it's not normally for the money. Right. And that was something that I found um, that I learned. My biggest lesson learned out of all that, the mental crash was if you're, if you define success and it stops in your life or it could stop in your life, you're setting yourself up, at least for my, myself, I'm setting myself up for a midlife, midlife crisis. Cause I built, if I build a $20 million company and then I sell it, well, now I don't have my company. So I just have all this money. But, but if I go, Hey, my story is about, I'm going to sell this company and I'm going to give $10 million away to whatever. Okay. There's a big purpose to that. Or I'm going to roll $10 million into the next business and do this. So it's, it's a, it's a story loop that keeps going and it doesn't end. And what I was doing, and you hinted to it is I was an achiever, just a high achiever. And as I was achieving things, people from the outside would go, Oh, you're incredibly successful. I'm like, well, I, didn't, I hadn't even defined success for myself. So I was just achieving all these things. I, I got a mar I got married and, uh, to a beautiful woman. And I was like, that's an achievement. I had kids. That's an achievement. And I just kept layering all of these things on in my life, but I never said no to things until I crashed. And then I said, okay, let me define success for myself as I'm going through my rebuilding phase. And what I found even with that is if I define success that points at me, I, Dominic Tyke, I'm successful, that stops the story. So then I had to take the next step, which was what significance do, does this have? And what I found is that it doesn't matter how much property I acquire. It doesn't how much matter how much wealth I acquire. It wasn't making me that much happier. It was cool. It was kind of a game and I enjoyed the game behind it. But I realized that within one generation, my kids could just fight over it, hate each other and, and just squander it. So what I thought, you know, as I, as the more and more I thought about single seat mindset, that company, 
giving back. It has significance. And when you publish these books and people buy them, my kids will never be able to go around the world and pull these books off of people's shelves. So there's some significance there that lives on that is timeless, right? And that was something that I learned is that significance, sharing, giving back, right? Like big names like Tony Robbins talks about like the secret to living is giving. So just giving back in any way that you can, not giving your house away and becoming a bum, but sharing. If you can't share 10% of a hundred thousand, are you going to be able to share 10% of 10 million? So start sharing, giving back, (laughs) and that provides a ton of significance, which leads to purpose. And you can put that into action every single day. And holy smokes, there's some, to use a fighter pilot term, there's your afterburner uh, results that you need. Now, I will caveat that with one thing, as you do more and more and you get more ideas and you start achieving more, you need to say no to about 99% of the things, all right? Because that leads to, as, as I would say, flame out. Because in a single seat jet with a single engine, if I run out of gas, the flame that uses the gas to provide my thrust, if that flames out, then I crash. I just, I glide like a brick. So to avoid the flame out, um, as you start to grow and you get all these good ideas and you get all these businesses and all this stuff going on in your life, you need to start learning as you start to feel that pain and that fear moving forward, go, should I, does this help me build something that has significance that's going to flame me out or that leads to the bigger picture. It may be a good idea. It may help, but it is, is it the biggest help for that? And I think that's important to define for yourself as you start. Oh, that's amazing. I love that Pearl. You know, you have to let the audience know you alluded to it a few times, but if you could let the audience know how they can get the books or how they can contact your company, um, on, on, on the internet. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I'm calling it my new launch pad because in Single Seat Wisdom Volume 2, we have our first astronaut author. He was a fighter pilot, test pilot, and then he's been to freaking outer space. So this dude has a different perspective on life for sure. He views the world in a completely different dimension. Um, But singleseatmindset.com, that is our what we'll call our launch pad. Um, so singleseatmindset.com, but for your listeners, the first three that can go to singleseatmindset.com forward slash podcast gift, all one word, all lowercase. If you sign up there, I'll send the first three people that sign up listening to this, a, if they live in the U S a free copy of our book, single seat wisdom, volume one. If you live outside the U S just contact me and I'll figure out how to get you one of these books. Awesome. And single, right? S I N G L E. Yes. Like a, like I am sitting in one seat, single seat. There's only one seat in the jet. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Cause I know sometimes when you're listening, you may not necessarily like catch how the word is spelled and then you don't get to the place. And I just want, I want to avoid that. Awesome. Yeah. That is fantastic. Well, oh my gosh, this has been such a riveting conversation and uh, we are at that point of the show where we do our fill in the blank. Are you ready, Dominic? I'm ready. ready. The you hit me with okay. this. All right. I'm going right, to do it go, live. Go. All right. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. The first one is, if I am fearless, I will. Take action. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. The next one is, to me, fearless freedom means. One word, action. I know that that's not groundbreaking. However, in the face of fear, the people that are taking action will usually be at least 50% ahead of the people that are sitting back, just figuring out what to do, put a, put a plan together to get you moving and then take action, put it into action. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good practical advice. I appreciate that. And then last but not least, my battle cry is. Sorry, you broke up a little bit. Can you hit me with that one more time? Yeah, sure. The last one is my battle cry is. Oh man, my battle cry is, um, I'm a Christian, so it's going to be Christian base and it's, um, Jesus help me. Okay. <laughs> I, all right. Because <laughs> Jesus take I the wheel. That, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love Jesus it. take the wheel. Right. <laughs> ah, I love that. Yeah. So it's Jesus, Jesus help me or Jesus save me or please like what's I going on. <laughs> 
Oh, that's great. That is great. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us at the Pharaoh's Freedom Tribe. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing the lovely stories of those that you have captured in the books. That is absolutely amazing. And we appreciate you and everything that you're doing. Well, I'm grateful for you and thank you for having me on your show. I had a great time. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Again, I'm Dr. G. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe so that you can get notified of when the next episode is going to be. And also, I'll catch you next time. Have a great one. Be strong, be brave, and unleash your greatness.